Hello, so I'm Matt Kelly, and the topic of this lecture is the evolution of the auditory system. This is a new lecture for your essentials starting in 2023, and what I hope that you'll take away from this lecture is the following. Um, first, we'll talk about the unique situation that vertebrates first experienced when they first came up on land and were, uh, were exposed to this new sensory modality, which was the propagation of sound or pressure waves in air. We'll then talk about how those new vertebrates, those first land-based vertebrates, co-opted several existing structures within their heads to generate a system that would allow them to perceive those pressure waves. And finally, we'll finish up by discussing how the mammalian lineage then took that basic system and really significantly improved it to, uh, through a number of changes to really generate the remarkable auditory system that we see in mammals today. All right, so for the purposes of this lecture, we're going to restrict our definition of hearing to mean the perception of airborne pressure waves. Now, this doesn't mean that pressure waves don't exist in water, and it doesn't mean that fish can't hear those pressure waves. In fact, fish can hear those pressure waves and have evolved a number of unique structures to help them do so. We just don't have time to talk about that today. All right, so in terms of pressure waves or sound waves, what are the differences between air and water? Well, the main one is density. So water, by definition, has a density of 1,000 grams per liter. In contrast, air has a density of 1.2 grams per liter, so about 830 times less dense than water. What this means is that the energy required to create a pressure wave in air is much, much less than the energy required to create a pressure wave in water. However, when that pressure wave strikes a, a structure with a higher density, like a vertebrate body, because the energy is so low, most of that pressure wave is either going to be absorbed when it first hits the body, or it's going to be reflected away. Um, and as a result, it's very difficult for the just general parts of a vertebrae to perceive those pressure waves. So many of you may have noticed that if you put your hand up against a very loud speaker, you can hear the sound vibrating on your hand right next to the speaker. But as soon as you move your hand just a little ways away, you no longer feel that. The other way to think about it is that we, there are sound waves in the air all the time, but we don't feel them impacting on our face or our hands. So detection of pressure waves requires uh, the evolution of a new system that allow that would allow vertebrates to actually perceive those sounds, those fairly low energy sounds that existed within their new environment. So before talking about the evolution of the auditory system, I wanted to do just a very brief review of vertebrate evolution for those of you who haven't thought about this from college or perhaps have never thought about it. Uh, and I'll start by mentioning something that evolution is not. And that is not, uh, evolution is not a linear process. So I was sort of surprised to be able to pull up a slide like this one from Google Images really easily, because this is a concept that's been largely discredited over time. Um, what, this, what this image shows you is a very old idea that somehow vertebrates evolved in a linear fashion from jawless fish through primitive fish through sharks, bony fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And the reason that this, with each one of those, it's becoming more complex. And the reason that this occurred was most likely because this group here, and all of his, this gentleman here, and all of his descendants are members of the mammalian group. And so there was a rather egotistical view that this must be the most complex group because, he's a, because he and his group are members of it. Uh, in fact, evolution is a much more convoluted and uh, interesting process that we'll talk about in the next slide. So here is a very useful depiction of vertebrate evolution. On the left-hand side, you can see the different a uh, different er eras in geologic time with their time periods in millions of years ago listed. And then on the right, you can see the different groups of vertebrate classes. And in this case, the brown bands here illustrate the uh, species complexity or diversity within each of those classes. So what you can see here is that vertebrates first began to evolve here about 500 to 545 million years ago in the Cambrian period. And those first initial bony fishes really had their heyday here in terms of species diversity in the Devonian before basically narrowing down to just a handful of species, jawless fish, that persist until today. And we'll talk about these a little bit more later. They're the lampreys and the hagfish. As development occur, as evolution continued, you can see a couple of different points where we have these very narrow brown bands that extend out and often lead to the creation of new types of vertebrates. So these are, this type of event is, in evolution, is referred to as a punctuated equilibrium event. And this is an event in which a very small group of animals are subjected, are thought to be subjected to a very strong selective pressure that results in a very rapid change in the creation of a new type of vertebrate. 
There are two of these that are relevant to our discussion today. And the first one is here. So this is the formation of land vertebrates, so tetrapods. So we're moving from fish here to amphibians, which are the first land-based vertebrates. And the second one we can see is here. And so this is the formation of mammals, the development of mammals. So you'll notice that the first one, the first vertebrates moved onto land about 360 million years ago. And then mammals began to evolve about 220 million years ago. Uh, finally, I want to mention a couple of phrases, a couple of terms that are used in lieu of complexity, as we saw, as we saw in the previous graph, and that is ancestral traits versus derived traits. So an ancestral trait is one that is basically shared by all the members of a group. As an example, all sharks and rays and fishes have gills that they used to breathe. A derived trait is one that often is a newer trait, it's thought to arise more recently in the evolutionary record, and typically is restricted to just a smaller number of animals within a particular group. As an example, while, all, while most fish um, actually maintain their body temperature based on the temperature of their environment, we now know that tuna actually maintain higher temperatures in their muscle, eyes, and brain, and this helps them to function somewhat better. Uh, so I will probably not use these terms too much, but on occasion I may, with the rest of the lecture, mention both ancestral and derived traits. All right, so what, as we mentioned, so when vertebrates first emerged onto land, they, be, they then became gained access to this new potential sensory modality, which was the perception of these pressure waves that were created within the air. However, their bodies really didn't have any structures that were suitable for detecting those incoming pressure waves. And so they had to evolve a number of different structures to help them actually perceive pressure waves. And those are listed here. The first was to evolve a flexible membrane, subsequently called a tympanic membrane, which stands for drum, that would actually respond, it was flexible enough to respond to those incoming pressure waves. Uh, in order for that membrane to be able to vibrate, it needed to have low density regions, low density structures on both sides of it. So it had to have air both on the outside and also on the inside. Once that flexible membrane was vibrating to a sound wave, it needed to be able to confer or convey that vibration to an inner to a structure within the brain that was actually going to perceive that vibration. It was then needed to be a structure within the inner ear to actually um, vibrate in response to that incoming vibrational uh, signal. And finally, there needed to be some type of cell type within the inner ear that was that had evolved to actually perceive vibrational energy and convert that into nervous impulses. And so I hope you can see how these different pieces put together would generate a system that could actually perceive sound waves in air. Now, I wanna to talk to you about how all of these different structures have evolved within those early vertebrates. And we'll start actually surprisingly at the bottom with the need for a mechanosensitive cell that can convert vibrational energy into nervous impulses. And we're starting here because it turns out that vertebrates, as far as we can tell, already had evolved mechanosensory hair cells prior to their emergence on land. Um, and I'll show you some data about that now. So first of all, this is a tomographic cast of the brain case and inner ear from a placodermal animal, placodermal fish that existed, as you can see here, um, down in the, in the Devonian area. So these are the placoderms right here, well before the emergence of land vertebrates. And what we can see in the ears of these in the ears of these animals, in the heads of these animals, is that they already have a re reasonably well-developed inner ear. So you can see here the three semicircular canals and a region here that's believed to contain the sacculus and lagina. And as a comparison, I'm showing you a similar drawing of the inner ear from an extant shark. This is a banded hound shark. And you can see that it looks very similar to the ear that existed in these placoderms. So as far as we can tell, there was a relatively well-evolved inner ear that was present in fish well before vertebrates began to move on land. Now, I mentioned that we think that hair cells also existed within these inner ears. That's a little harder to be more confident. Confidence is a little bit lower there. Um, hair cells are the type of thing that are not uh, that are not present, in the, not preserved or present in the fossil record. And so all we can do there is really to look at extant species that exist from vertebrate classes that are much older than the land-based vertebrates and ask whether we see hair cells within those animals. And so if we can look at what we're going to do now is look at the presence of hair cells in lampreys. All right. So 
Um, as I mentioned, lampreys are here. They're one of the few remaining jawless fishes that you can see right here. This is a picture of a sea lamprey. They're really lovely creatures. They have no jaws. They sort of have this sucker for a mouth. And what they do is they swim around, latch onto a fish. Um, using that sucker mouth, they then have essentially have teeth on their tongues, which they use to scrape an opening in the side of the fish. Their saliva contains an anticoagulant, so they can then just essentially keep that wound open and continue to essentially just suck out the, the derived nutrients from that open wound in the fish. Really a lovely lifestyle. Um, there are reports that if you spend too much time in the Great Lakes, where there are a lot of these, people have reported having them try to ex attach to their legs when their body temperature gets too cold. So despite the primitive lifestyle of lampreys, they do in fact have an inner ear. You can see its structure is quite rudimentary here, but they have two semicircular canals and these sentry patches depicted in green. And a recent study looked at the hair cells within those patches. And so this is phylloidin labeling, which labels the stereocilia bundles. And this is an SEM view of one of these patches. And what you can see are what look like relatively well-developed hair cells within the rudimentary inner ear of this very primitive vertebrate or very uh, the sea lamprey. Um, now it's possible because there's no preservation within the fossil record, it's always possible that this is an example of convergent evolution. So the idea that the same structure or cell type evolved independently in multiple lineages within the vertebrate classes. And that possibility cannot be ruled out. However, if you look at both the, the genetics of hair cell development and also the genetics of hair cell function, it's essentially exactly the same in all vertebrate classes. And so while that's, as I said, well, it's possible that this is an example of convergent evolution, it's much more likely that this is a reflection of the fact that hair cells have evolved, evolved very early in the vertebrate lineage and have persisted along, this, along all the different vertebrate classes over time. All right, so if we come back here to our components for vertebrate audition, um, we've, we've talked about the last one here, which is the need for a mechanosensitive cell. Hair cells were already present within the, within the vertebrates before they even came up on land, so this was not a problem. And the problem was per was these other structures that are required to actually perceive and convey that signal to the inner ear. So we'll talk about these first two next: the evolution of a flexible membrane, the tympanic membrane, and the need for that membrane to be bounded on both sides by low density air filled spaces. Um, we'll talk about these together because they evolve together. And before we do that, I want to talk about a concept from the 1920s referred to as the Meckel series law, which states that ontogeny, or which means embry embryology, recapitul recapitulates phylogeny. And basically, Meckel's and Ceres were Meckel and Ceres were two scientists who suggested the idea that if you look at the embryologic development of an or of a vertebrate organism, it would go through different phases that reflected the different phases of the adult phenotypes of all of its evolutionary ancestors. Now that turns out to not be true. However, we can use uh, embryology as a way to view uh, common structures that exist within all vertebrates during their embryologic development, but may have different actual functions in mature animals depending on the class that we're looking at. So as I said, this can be useful as a guide. The structures that we'll be talking about today are pharyngeal arches. These are embryonic structures that give rise to gills and gill slits in sharks and bony fishes, and that are also present in vertebrate embryos that live on land, including humans, although they, give rise, they don't give rise, obviously, to gills in those structures. So as most of you are probably aware, sharks have these gill slits on the side of their body. You can see them here. They open on the side of the body and also into the pharynx. The shark takes water in through its mouth, pushes that water through that gill slit, which has a gill within it, and the gill extracts oxygen from the water. You see something similar in bony fish. You can see the gills here. They're just typically covered with a bony perculum. Now, those gills and gill slits arise from a series of embryonic structures called pharyngeal arches, which are basically involutions here on the lateral side of the embryo. They end up forming a gap between the pharynx and the lateral body wall, and the, lung, and the gills form along the sides of these, which you can see here. Now, while land-based vertebrates, including humans, no longer have gill slits or gill arches, we do still see those pharyngeal arches during embryonic development. You can see those here in this depiction of a human embryo that's been sort of cut off on top to show you the presence of the gill arches. Um, now, in addition to the sort of standard gill arches you can see here, there's also this rather unique anterior-most uh, uh, pharyngeal arch structure that's referred to as a spiracle. Instead of forming a gill arch or gill slit, as we can see here, the spiracle actually forms a tubular structure that extends from the pharynx up to the lateral body wall. 
And unlike the gill arches or pharyngeal arches, there are no, there's no breathing apparatus within the spiracle. So what does the spiracle do then? Well, we can see what spiracles do if we look at a couple of different types of marine species. So the first one here is a southern stingray, and I'm showing you two views, a dorsal view here and a ventral view here. Stingrays, of course, are extremely compressed along the dorsal ventral um, axis, and they have a separation of their different of some of their different uh, pharyngeal arch structures. So you can see the gills here on the bottom of the stingray. This is its mouth, and these are the nares here. And if you look at the surface of the, of the fish, of the stingray, you can actually see the eye, and then behind it, this very large opening that's a spiracle. So under normal circumstances, stingrays will take water in through their mouth and force it out through their gills the same way that sharks would. But southern stingrays, and most stingray, a lot of stingrays, tend to spend a lot of time buried in the sand with only their eyes and the spiracles sticking up above. Um, so the way that they then breathe is they actually pull water in through their spiracles and then out through their gills. Uh, so it's essentially an accessory breathing apparatus. Now the interesting thing here is that the relative position of the spiracle and as the anterior pharyngeal arch and just behind the eye is not that far off from where we would expect to see where we know the middle ear is located within the cranium. And perhaps a, and there's a really nice example of that here if we look at this blue shark. So this is a blue shark. Here's its eye. And here's this hole right here, which if you thought this was a, a hearing vertebrate, you might think was its ear hole, was the external auditory meatus. This, in fact, is a spiracle from the, from the shark. If you dissect the pharynx of the shark, you can see the openings of the spiracles right here and right here. So what we have here is a tubular type communication that goes from the pharynx up to the lateral surface of the, of the shark. Now, if we look at the association of the position of the spherical relative to the inner ear, we can see that they're really quite close together. So here's that same drawing I showed you before of a human embryo cut off to show you the pharyngeal arches. Here's an actual human embryo. Here's that first pharyngeal arch, so the spherical is going to form right here. And at this very early time point, the otocyst is actually located right here, essentially at the same anterior position, anterior posterior position, as the spherical, which is going to form right here. Um, so that's quite intriguing in terms of the potential association between the spiracular structure and the developing inner ear. Now that association is that association is clearer if we look in a different view. So this is essentially a head-on view. So it's as if we're looking at straight into the straight on from the front of the fish drive, swimming towards us. Here's the pharynx or throat, and here's the spiracle extending upwards and making this opening on the surface. And you'll notice that in this anterior posterior view, the spiracle is very closely associated with the inner ear, which is sitting here within the brain case. And I hope you can see how this seems very, this is very similar in structure to what we see in the human middle ear, where we have a pharynx down here, the eustachian tube is here, middle ear space is here, and it has an association with the inner ear, which is right here. And so as far as we can tell, what happened in terms of evolution of the middle ear space is that the spiracle, as I'll show you in the next slide, uh, once it was freed from its need to be used as a breathing apparatus, became available as a middle ear space that could be used as a space that could actually provide a vibrational structure for perception of uh, airborne sounds. And the way that this worked is that the spiracle continued to extend up from the pharynx to the lateral surface of the, of the body wall but rather than forming an opening of thin membrane was left at the end of the spiracle that ended up becoming the flexible tympanic membrane. Now, because once the animal moved on, once vertebrates moved on to land, their pharynx was then filled with air, and this air then was able to fill also into the spiracular space, creating essentially a middle ear, the middle ear space. All right, so in the last couple of slides, I've explained to you how the spiracle, this accessory breathing apparatus, what became available to be used as a middle ear space once vertebrates moved onto land and no longer need to use it for breathing. Um, so now the, now the vertebrates had a structure that could actually vibrate in response to incoming sound waves. They then needed a way to convey that vibrational activity in the, in the tympanic membrane into the, middle, into the inner ear. And this required a stiff structure that could basically form an association with the tympanic membrane and also with the inner ear to convey that to convey that vibration. And so the way that this happened has to do with a very interesting, with another change in the lifestyle of the animals that had to do with their moving onto land. So if you think about fish, they tend to have very limited to absolutely no neck whatsoever. 
Um, and in fact, they have a number of bones at the backside of their cranium that form connections between their skull and their axial skeleton to help hold their skull together. Um, and you can see some of these here in green. So this, in particular, this one called the hyomandibular here. Um, once vertebrates moved onto land, one of the things that they needed to do was to be able to breathe better. And this required a lot of gulping of air. And so apparently one thing that happened was that they needed to evolve a neck so that they could move their head a little bit better to gulp in air. In order to do that, what they needed to do was to reduce these connections between their cranium and their axial skeleton so that their head could move. And as a result, some of these, jaw, some of these bones sitting at the back of the cranium, such as the hyomandibular, um, were no longer being used as, as sutures for securing the cranium. And that freed up the embryological structures that gave rise, that give rise to those bones to serve other purposes. Now, what's interesting about the hyomandibular, it's hard to see here in the stride view drawing, is that if we look head on, we can see that the hyomandibular sits in a position that's very conducive to playing a role in evolution of the, of the auditory system. So here's that same picture I showed you before, but now I've added in the hyomandibular bone, which you can see here. And you can see that it makes a connection here on the cranium, just adjacent to the, the inner ear. It sits just in front of that sporacular tube that we know is going to give rise to the middle ear space. And it also comes out here and makes a connection to the lateral body wall. So it's fairly easy to see, and I'll show you in the next slide, how this bone, once freed up from its role in supporting the jaw, could be co-opted evolutionarily to create a communication between the tympanic membrane here and the inner ear right here. And we can see that in that slide. So here's the same picture I just showed you um, of the ancestral situation where the, the, uh, the higher mandibular acts as a structural support for the jaw. Once that's no longer required, you can see how we, we would require a fairly minimal change to actually convert this bone and co-opt it to create a, a strut that would to create a communication here between the tympanic membrane and the inner ear space. It requires that the insertion point of this bone move up somewhat to communicate with the tympanic membrane and also the formation of a round of the, of the oval window or uh, which, as it's referred in ancestral vertebrates as the uh, vestibular fenestra here that allows that bone now to convey vibrational input from the tectorial, from the tympanic membrane here to the middle ear space. And what I'm showing you here, so this is a primitive amphibian, and now I'm showing you here is the anatomy from an extant lizard showing you how this basic system has persisted into modern times. So here is the middle ear space here. This is the single bone um, going from the tympanic membrane to the uh, vestibular fenestra, and then here's the inner ear here. So this conversion, the hyomandibular, results in it becoming, refer becoming this, the single inner ear ossicle that exists in the ears of all non-mammalian land vertebrates. It's referred to as either the stapes or the columella. All right, so if we come back to our list of components of vertebrate audition, we've now been able to add the stiff structure um, that's required to convey vibrational sound waves that are coming into the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. And basically, this is accomplished by taking the hyomandibular bone, which is no longer required to support the jaw and the cranium, to now form a, a structure that can communicate between the tympanic membrane and the vestibular fenestra, which is the future oval window. So finally, we need a vibration. We need to evolve a vibration-sensitive structure within the inner ear. So most of the sensory patches in the inner ear that are involved in vestibular perception tend to sit right on top of bony structures. And in fact, many of them have uh, otoconia or otoliths sitting over them that make them, uh, make them less sensitive to, to very subtle movement, subtle input energy, such as vibrational energy, and more sensitive to large head movement types of energy. So what needs to happen here is that the inner ear needs to evolve a vibrational structure that can actually respond to these lower energy inputs that are coming in from the uh, from this new tympanic membrane to stapes uh, structure. So this occurs through the essentially the invention of a new or the evolution of a new sensory epithelium that is essentially stretched between the sacculus, the saccular sensory epithelium, saccular sensory epithelium, which is here, and the laginar sensory epithelium, which sits right here. And this is again for our shark. You can see these two are here. And if we now jump to a bird, which is a rather extreme example of this, the sacculus is up here, 
the Lagina is up here and you see we've had this evolutionary extension that includes uh, what amounts to a suspended region of sensory epithelium going between the two. And what's unique about this sensory epithelium is that it's not sitting on any on any bony structures. It basically has fluid-filled structures both on its apical surface and its luminal surface, and this allows it to vibrate in response to incoming incoming signals. You can see that drawn here in a different type of depiction. So here is the uh, tympanic membrane, columella sitting on the oval window, creating a vibration that then creates movements here within the basal rupilla. And you can see in a cross section, the basal rupilla has fluid on the surface, on the apical surface, on the luminal surface, and the basal surface here, allowing it to vibrate in response to these incoming vibratory signals. This is just an example from an alligator of an actual basal rupilla. This is a cross section like this. You can see the hair cells here. You can see they're suspended between fluid on this side and this side. And so when the columella is vibrated, this creates a vibrational wave that can actually move this epithelium and that can then stimulate the hair cells resulting in perception of those sounds. Finally, if we look at uh, casts of inner ears from different reptiles over evolutionary time, which is depicted here from very early reptiles through to existing birds, um, we can see that there's been a progressive selective pressure to extend that auditory region of the epithelium of the inner ear, which you can see right here, to give rise to an elongated auditory organ. And so if we now come back to our summary of components of vertebrate audition, we've been able, what we've talked about is different evolutionary changes that have managed to achieve all the different components that we think are required for early vertebrates to be able to perceive sound waves that propagate through the air. So they've developed a flexible membrane, a tympanic membrane, as a result of the uh, failure of the spiracle to open onto the body surface. However, the fact that the spiracle communicates with the pharynx, which is now an air-filled structure, um, provides a membrane, provides a situation where that flexible tympanic membrane can now vibrate back and forth. The hyomandibular bone has been converted to a primitive stapes as a result of the fact that it's no longer required for stabilization of the skull. Um, and within the inner ear, we've seen the development of this basal rapilla, essentially a sort of hammock-like auditory, hammock-like sensory structure that's suspended between two fluid-filled spaces and can vibrate in response to the input energy from the stapes. And of course, the <clears throat> these early vertebrates already had mechanosensory hair cells, which were very well suited to actually perceive those, that incoming vibrational energy. And so with these evolutionary changes, we see the appearance of uh, an auditory system that really works quite well. Um, auditory sensitivity is quite good, and the frequency range is reasonable. Um, so for the most part, the system worked quite well in frequencies from uh, 0 to 10 hertz through to I've written 10 kilohertz here, but it's really more like about one to two kilohertz. Um, it works quite well. Certainly birds, um, such as owls, are using the system to hear as high as 10 to 12 kilohertz. Um, so they're sort of the best ones that are using the system. But it's really a system that works quite well at relatively low frequencies. All right, so now let's talk about how mammals have gone ahead and changed this system to improve, significantly improve its functionality. Um, first, a little bit of background about the mammalian lineage. So the mammalian lineage, as I showed you, arose about 220 million years ago. It was one of these examples of punctuated equilibrium. Um, and I just want to sort of set the stage for you by talking about what was going on at that time. So this is the Triassic period. Dinosaurs are plentiful. They're basically the primary types of vertebrates that exist on the planet. Um, and they come in very all shapes and sizes. Um, they are, to a large extent, heterothermic, which means that their body temperature reflects the temperature of the environment that surrounds them. And as a result, they are almost exclusively diurnal because they need the warmer the, the sun to warm up their body systems, basically, so things can work right. This provides a really interesting niche if you are a new animal type, such as a mammal, that's homeothermic and can maintain your own body temperature. And that niche is the nocturnal niche, right? So the dinosaurs tend to be asleep at night because it gets cold. So there's this entire time period when a new type of animal can actually take advantage of the fact that dinosaurs are sleeping and not acting as predators. In order to be successful with this new, in this new niche, the new mammals need to be able to improve their ability to perceive their environment in low light. And we can see a number of evolutionary changes that are present within the mammalian lineage that are direct reflection 
of that initial nocturnal lifestyle. Um, as many of you may know, uh, most mammals have largely rod-based retinas, so rods don't see colors. They're not particularly good at visual acuity, so they don't see fine detail, but they are really good at working at night. And so they're very good at picking up low light levels, which is exactly what these animals needed to deal with. Another mammalian change has been a significantly improved sense of smell. As many of you may be aware, roughly 10% of the mouse genome is, uh, the mouse transcriptome is devoted to um, odor receptors. So a huge amount of their, huge amount of their transcriptome to, is devoted to perceiving different smells. And what's relevant for us is in terms of their auditory system, they evolve a number of changes that significantly increase the sensitivity and discrimination of their auditory system, and in particular, they vastly expands the frequencies that they can perceive. So this is a really nifty graph that depicts that. Basically, this is showing you the frequency range and sensitivity frequency ranges for different types of vertebrates. And what you'll see here at the top of the graph are fish and amphibians that we've talked about here in blue and green. They tend to hear in the range from 10 to 100 hertz up to 1 to 5 kilohertz. Please note that this is a logarithmic scale. Um, then we have some birds such as owl, uh, such as canaries and parakeets and things here that here are slightly higher up to sort of pushing 10 kilohertz. And here's our owl that here's to about 12 kilohertz. But then when we start including, we start looking at mammalian frequency ranges, we start seeing a significant increase in performance here. So you'll notice here that some of these, uh, some of these different mammals here can hear up into the 10, up to 20 to 50 kilohertz range. And then if we jump down here to the bottom, we can see the real champion here. So we have the little brown bat, which can hear to about 123, uh, 115 kilohertz. And then three different types of adonisite whales um, that can hear upwards of 150 kilohertz. And in fact, not depicted on here, there are some bats that are thought to be able to hear possibly as high as 200 kilohertz. So really a remarkable increase in the ability to perceive a much broader range of frequencies in mammals. So how did mammals accomplish this? We can basically talk about three, about six different changes that led to the improved performance of the mammalian auditory system. First is the evolution of outer ears. Second is the addition of two additional middle ear ossicles or bones. Um, third are changes in the shape of the cochlea in terms of both its length and its structure, it becomes coiled. There are some internal structural changes we'll talk about within the cochlea. There's the evolution of unique hair cell types that we'll talk about. And finally, there's the evolution of electromotility, which is totally based on changes in the structure and function of a protein called Preston. So let's talk about each one of these individually. So the first of these modifications is the evolution of outer ears. And these outer ears develop from two of those actual pharyngeal arches, which are no longer being used for the formation of gills. They're now giving rise to the structures that can form the outer ears. Um, so outer ears play a huge role in allowing animals to actually collect and focus sound waves and then lead them into their external auditory meatus. If any of you have been to any number of lectures on hearing, you've probably seen pictures of these guys, the fennec fox. People really like the size of these ears relative to the size of the, of the animal. Um, that's probably largely in part because they also use this, these fairly thin membranes as a cooling mechanism, but it certainly looks like a lovely set of ears. Um, perhaps more relevant is if you look at this picture of a cow's cat, you can see the ears like this that play a role in focusing hearing. And if any of you have a cat, you've ever noticed, if it hears a sound on one side or the other, you can often see it, it'll actually turn its ears to try and focus that sound into its ears. Um, a couple of other examples here of interesting ears. There's a bat-eared fox that has these big ears. And finally, here's an actual bat, which of course uses its ears um, to detect prey, as you can see here. So the next mammalian modification is the addition of two additional uh, inner ear ossicles. Um, and this, uh, the ability, the, these ossicles also evolve once again from a change in the draw structure of the vertebrates. So um, in contrast with most other vertebrates, which typically tend to just eat their food, use their jaws to basically just grab their food and swallow it whole, mammals as part of their evolution into these new niches um, several types of mammals uh, that are under selective pressure to be able to start to chew their food. And this requires a change in their general jaw structure to create a jaw that has more flexibility and stability to it. And so if we look at those changes, you can see here what one of the main changes that occurs is a change in jaw articulation. 
So in vertebrates, we have multiple bones giving rise to the lower jaw and the cranium. And the articulations between two bones here are referred to as the articular and the quadrate. And so this is the articulation right here. In mammals who have evolved a more stable and flexible jaw structure, um, we see a progressive loss of bones within the within the jaw such that only the dentary bone is now present. And it now forms its articulation with the squamosal bone that you can see right here. And so this is now the connection. What this means is that these two bones, the articular and the quadrate bones, are now no longer required to give rise to the jaw and are therefore freed up to become part of the middle ear space. And so the articular bone develop, becomes the malleus and the quadrate bone becomes the incus. They already have an association because they formed one here as this articulation, but now they're using that articulation, as you can see here, in the to form the middle to form these two middle ear bones. And the addition of these two bones, as you heard earlier in lectures earlier today, um, provides not just a way to convey vibration from the surface, from the tympanic membrane to the middle, to the inner ear, but now actually provides amplification of those incoming sounds as a result of the structures within those three bones. I'll finish our discussion of the evolution of middle ear bones with an interesting story of ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny, and this has to do with marsupials. So as we talked about early in the lecture, there are a number of different marsupials. This is one you see around this area a lot. This is a possum. But we're, and I want to show you this one here. This is an Australian marsupial called a fat-tailed dunnert. It's about the size of a mouse. And the reason I'm showing you this is because I was able to find this great picture of a P0 fat-tailed dunnert. So as you can see, when these animals are born, they're incredibly immature. So there's no real eyes or much development of the face here, no hind limbs yet, just these forelimbs. However, at this time, these, these newborns have to crawl or drag themselves up into the mother's pouch and then use their jaws, which must be partially functional at this time point, to attach to one of the teats within the mom's pouch in order to gain sustenance. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look at the jaw structure at these, in these very immature marsupials, you can see evidence of an articulation that's actually using one of the middle, future middle ear bones. So, if you look here, this is showing you the drawings of the jaw articulation, the presence of the jaw articulation of middle ear bones for a mouse and a possum. And you can see, as we showed in the pre as I showed you in the previous images, here's the dentary bone making this connection with the squamosal, and that's true in both the mature adult mouse and the adult possum. Now, if we look at the day of birth in a, in a mouse, we see exactly the same thing. So here's the dentary making this jaw articulation with the squamosal bone right here. But if we look in the possum at the, essentially at the day of birth, what we see is the dentary bone is much smaller, which you can see here. And the jaw articulation is actually between the quadrate bone, this one in green here, and the skull case, which is right here. Now this quadrate bone is actually going, as the animal continues to develop, the quadrate bone will actually move out of here and transition into the incus, which will then make a connection with the stapes to serve as part of the inner ear ossicular chain. And the dentary will grow out and actually create a new articulation here. What we can see at this early time point is a functional jaw that's now using one of the future middle ear bones as that, as that primitive articulation. This is a really nice example of an evolutionary remnant that we can see during the early development of these animals. All right, so the next change that we see that we're going to talk about in the mammalian ear is a progressive extension of the cochlea and also the uh, advent of coiling. So it, just as an example, the average length of the basal pill in a bird is about 7 millimeters. In contrast, mammalian cochlea can be as long as 100 millimeters in length. Now, part of that is simply a result of the fact that birds are constrained in their size because they need to be able to fly, and mammals can get very big, can have, and as a result, can have very big cochleas. But if we look at the evolution of the mammalian inner ear and the cochlea, which is what's shown here, we can see that there's a progressive increase in the extension and coiling of the cochlea as, as mammals evolve. Um, as far as we can tell, the coiling is generally thought to be a space-saving maneuver that allows the cochlea to get longer without taking up valuable space within the brain case. However, work from a couple of labs, including Richard Chadwick's here at NIDCD, have suggested that the coil structure may in fact play a role in improving propagation of sound waves along the cochlea as well. That's certainly something that's open for debate. A final change that we see that's related to this is that the lagina, 
which normally sits at the very, <clears throat> you recall that the lagina sits at the end of the, of the vasa papilla in birds and reptiles. In mammals, the lagina is completely gone as far as we can tell. There's no sign of any vestibular structure here at the apical surface of the cochlea. Now, whether the lagina has completely disappeared or if those sensory cells have become incorporated into the apex of the cochlea is not clear. Certainly developmentally, there seem to be some <clears throat> uh, unique components to the apical 20 or 25 percent of the cochlea, suggesting it might have a slightly different origin from the rest of the epithelium. We just don't know. But we do know for sure that all signs of any vestibular function or vestibular sensory epithelia in the cochlea have disappeared with the evolution of this elongated coiled cochlea. We also see structural changes within the cochlear duct itself, which we believe occur to improve vibrational isolation and performance within the epithelium. So here in a bird, you can see that all of the hair cells are basically suspended, as we talked about, between one fluid filled space and another. And this, prevents, this provides a situation in which you can have fairly large vibrational movements of the entire epithelium. In the mammalian cochlea, we see the ingrowth of two different lips, lips or shells of bone, referred to as the primary and secondary spiral lamina. One is right here, and the second is right here. And what these seem to do is to provide vibrational isolation or stability, such that the inner hair cell that sits right here is now vibrationally isolated, while vibrations are just driving the epithelium in this region here. And this seems to provide an increased level of acuity in terms of how vibrations are transmitted within the epithelium. All right, so <clears throat> next we can talk about the evolution of unique cell types, unique hair cell types. Now, as we've talked about on a couple of slides prior to this, this is a bit more challenging because there is no fossil record for hair cell types, um, obviously. And so in this case, what we need to do is to look at extant types of mammals and try to understand when hair cells might, when unique hair cell types might have evolved based on last common, last final common ancestors. So this is just a cladogram for different mammalian lineages. There are a couple of failed lineages that you can see here. And the most relevant are, ones are that we have three right now, the monotremes, the egg-laying mammals, the marsupials, and then the eutherians right here. Um, so if we look at this monotreme group, which separated from the eutherians about 180 million years ago, we can ask whether we see any signs of specialized hair cells, inner, inner and outer hair cells within that group. So there are only four species of, monot of monotremes. These are the duckbill platypus and then three different species of spiny anteaters, the echidnas. They're found only in Australia. They are egg-laying mammals. They lay a fairly leathery egg. And as I mentioned, the last common ancestor was 180 million years ago. So here's a picture of a duckbill platypus. And here's a picture of the inner ear from a duckbill platypus. And you'll notice that it has an extended cochlea, as we know is going to be present. Um, it's not really coiled, sort of has this hook-shaped kind of bent region that we can see right here. Um, but if we look inside, we can see some signs of hair cell specializations. So this is an SEM, uh, cross-section and SEM view from a platypus uh, cochlea. You can see here single row of inner hair cells, a couple of extra rows of inner hair cells, so perhaps three to four rows of inner hair cells here. A tunnel space that actually had, typically has three or four pillar cells, which you can see here in the cross-section, and then about eight rows of outer hair cells. So by comparison with the eutherian organ of Cordy, where we have just one row of inner hair cells and three rows of outers, we can see that we're not quite there yet in terms of complete evolution, but the, there's clearly the evidence of two different types of hair cells, inners and outers here, um, suggesting that specialized hair cells probably evolved somewhere between 220 million years ago when mammals first started to evolve and the separation between monotremes and eutherian mammals, which occurred about 180 million years ago. All right, finally, we can talk about electro, we'll talk about electromotility and Preston. So along with the evolution of specialized cell types, both inner and outers, we assume that this came hand in hand with the specialization of the outer hair cells then to act as a cochlear amplifier. Um, so as you'll learn over the course of this course, over the course of the next few days, um, one of the ways in which that's accomplished is that outer hair cells express a modified anion transporter called SLC26A5 on their lateral membranes. You can see that here. So you can see the green is this, is this SLC26A5 expressed on the lateral membranes of the outer hair cells. SLC26A5 is also referred to as Preston, 
Um, and Preston is absolutely required for allowing outer hair cells to change their, cha change their shape in response to depolarization. Um, that's illustrated quite nicely here in this graph from an older paper. So basically what we're looking at here are cell shape changes in response to either depolarization or hyperpolarization to the cell. So you can see this, you in inject voltage into the cell, it changes its shape. But if you look at a Preston mutant, that doesn't happen at all. Um, so very nicely demonstrating the, the crucial role of Preston in conferring outer hair cell electromotility. And of course, uh, and I didn't mention this, but it's generally believed that outer hair, the evolution of outer hair cell motility was absolutely required for the ability of mammals to hear higher frequencies, the evolution of higher frequency perception. And so a very interesting study was done several years ago to begin to look at the evolution of Preston as a, a molecule that can confer electromotility. And what was done in these study was to use hex cells and basically transfect them with Preston molecules from different types of vertebrates and ask how much cell shape change could be conferred onto those cells based on expression of Preston. So the results of those experiments are illustrated here. Basically, hex cells have been transfected with Preston from zebrafish, chicken, platypus, or guinea pig, and then they've been subjected to a sinusoidal polar depolarization and hyperpolarization wave that you can see here. In response to that, you can see the change in cell shape in the guinea pig, so this is a very active Preston. You can also see that neither chicken or zebrafish Preston induces any cell shape change. And interestingly, the platypus Preston has a sort of intermediate value where it can induce some cell shape change, but not as much as guinea pig Preston. And so this is probably, what this is probably depicting then is the evolutionary change of Preston from of an anion transporter here to an electromotile molecule that you can see right here. And while I don't have time to talk about it, nor have I really read the papers completely, there are a number of labs looking at the, at the specific amino acid changes that occur between zebrafish, platypus, and guinea pig Preston to understand how electromotility is conferred. Uh, finally, I'll finish up by saying that interestingly, if you look at the um, chloride ion transportability of Preston, which was its original role, you can see a inverse change in that as Preston becomes an electromotile molecule that loses its ability to transport chloride. So Pendrin here is a positive control. We're looking at, this is a graph for chloride transport. Pendrin is a very strong anion transporter and you see how much it's transporting. GFP of course has no role in, or in chloride transport. So this is sort of the, this is a negative control. And if you look at zebrafish, Preston, chicken, platypus or guinea pig, you can see that it, you see a progressive loss of anion transportability as you see this gain in uh, electromotility. Um, so a really interesting evolutionary history of how Preston has evolved to act as an electromotile molecule that drives outer hair cell electromotility. All right, so to summarize what we've talked about during this lecture is that when vertebrates first emerged onto land, they became exposed to this new sensory modality, which was airborne pressure waves that required relatively little energy to be created and to propagate. However, they lacked, those early vertebrates lacked a sensory system and a series of structures that would allow them to actually perceive this modality. They were fortunate in that they had an inner, they already had an inner ear with mechanosensory hair cells, which were well suited to actually perceive this type of input but they didn't have any system to actually perceive and convey those <clears throat> pressure waves from the air into the inner ear. What they were able to do then was to co-opt several different systems that were no longer required for their um, waterborne, waterborne roles. So the spiracle was no longer required as an accessory breathing apparatus, but was well situated to create a tympanic membrane within an air-filled middle ear. Also, as a result of the evolution of a neck, they freed up a bone within their within the, the posterior part of their skull, the hyomandibular, which then became converted to the stapes and formed an interaction with the tympanic membrane and a new opening into the middle ear space called the vestibular fenestri. And this allowed the system to then convey those vibrational, vibrational energy that was vibrating the tympanic membrane and pass that vibration into the inner ear. Within the inner ear, they developed a, uh, a, essentially a, a free hanging sensory epithelium, the basal rapilla, which was bounded by fluids on both sides and could then respond to incoming vibrational energy. And of course, because hair cells were already present, they had a cells type that could 
that it could perceive that vibrational energy and turn it into a nervous impulse. The system works quite well and is largely the system that's used in all vertebrates except mammals um, for perception of hearing to this day. Beginning about 220 million years ago, the mammals first appear, <clears throat> and in large part because of their primarily nocturnal lifestyle, they undergo selective pressure to improve the performance of their auditory system. They do this in a number of ways, which we talked about. Uh, they, uh, they develop external ears. They recruit two other bones from the inner ear, um, from the jaw, to give rise to a, a, a middle ear ossicle chain that can actually amplify signals that are coming in. They extend the cochlear duct to gain more space, to more, gain more auditory space. Um, and they rather rapidly evolve the hair cells into specialized cell types, both inners and outers, which play two, two different roles in auditory perception. And they, involve, and they evolve electromotility within the outer hair cells, largely through changes in the Preston molecule and its functionality. So that's the end of this lecture. I hope that you have come away with this from a good feeling, with a good feeling for the types of uh, for the types of uh, sensory challenges that new vertebrates faced when they first emerged on land, how those were addressed through the co-option of existing um, structures within primitive vertebrates, and how mammals took that system to a higher level to achieve the very high performing area that we have now. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>